Hi students, this tutorial forms the next section of the New South Wales HSC National Study on Japan from 1904 to 1937. In the previous tutorials we focused on the survey period, uh, which is that focusing from 1904 all the way up to 1921. Uh, so if you haven't watched those videos on why Japan you know, believed itself to be a global power, uh, how it was involved in World War I and the repercussions of that, and the economic, social, and political developments of the period leading up to 1921, then please make sure you go back and watch those videos before continuing on with this next tutorial in which we'll be focusing on the challenges to traditional power and authority in the 1920s in Japan. Uh, these photos that you see on this first slide really encapsulate the period. Uh, on the bottom left, we have the first May Day Parade. This is the traditional uh, Labor Day um, parade in which we see workers from across Japan unite for the very first time in you know, advocating for you know, workers' rights, things like unions, ability to strike, fair payment. Um, so this is you know, a time of a real social kind of change and upheaval. We then see images from the results of the Great Kanto Earthquake in 1923, which completely destroyed uh, you know, areas of, of Tokyo and Yokohama. We then see people lining outside the bank during the Showa financial crisis. This is a period of time where people lost a lot of faith in the banking system. Um, and led to a, a real kind of financial uh, difficulties of the, of the period and then culminating um, in 1928 with the crowning of Hirohito, the new emperor who's going to be the emperor of the Showa period, which is going to be the period or the imperial period that, we can, that is going to continue all the way through um, you know, and on to the end of, of World War II as well. Um, so it's a, it a period where we see, um, you know, again, you know, very similar to the period from 1904 to 1921, you know, social change, you know, a great deal of um, different forces impacting on the democratic stability um, of, of the Taisho democracy. So our key inquiry question for this you know, series of tutorials on the Taisho period um, is going to be, you know, to what extent did they effectively manage the pressures of, of the period? You know, were they effective um, and were they able to be a resilient democracy in the face of, of mounting kind of challenges? Um, before we get into um, looking at what happened during the period, it's really important that you understand these key terms because there can be things that we're going to continue to come back to as we move through the different tutorials. Um, some of them you already know. What I want you to draw your attention to is the two at the very bottom. So when we talk about you know challenges to traditional power, this in Japan is called kotuai. Um, so it, you know can refer to the kind of national kind of society, you know, how the political kind of organized society functions, um, and is also translated to the national essence, okay, what makes, you know, Japanese people Japanese. Um, and so when talking about traditional power, we're talking about the system of government that is established under the Meiji Constitution. Um, and whilst this, you know, did seek to, you know, include modern ideas of democracy, um, it did ultimately seek to retain the status and the position of the emperor. So when we're talking about traditional power, yes, whilst we need to think about the emperor, I also want to think about how this function within the broader kind of constitutional elements of the Taisho democracy. And we know from looking at the period before that this is very much a limited democracy. There is a lot of pressures from the oligarchs, from the army, um, from industry, which you know, help to destabilize this um, democracy. When we look at modern power, you know, this is a real challenge of the period. We see modern different thought. We see people being more democratic or more socialist. We see the influence of, of foreign ideas like communism. We see economic pressures, um, different in industrialists and people in the financial industry. And then we see different social ideas. You saw on the, on the first page, okay, the labor movement in 1920. We also see a rise of, of feminism as well. Um, and so a lot of these are brought to Japan from the West. And so this leads to a very hardening of these 
Kotu Dai ideals, where we see people seeking to protect you know, Japanese national power um, and being very kind of anti-foreigner, um, anti-Western, and lead to the you know, fermenting of these kind of ultra-nationalistic ideas. Um, which, as you can see in that first, um, you know, definition, is you know pride and love of one's country, um, and that is really kind of intensified, you know, um, you know, in the 1930s. But I want you to think about the seeds of this, okay, a beginning in the 1920s as well. So this is the the Taisho democracy, um, and it is for, for all intents and purposes. purposes an imperial democracy. Um, the emperor, who at this time is um, the Taisho emperor, um, he is still the head of state and is a constitutional monarchy. And so whilst he does not necessarily get involved too much in the constitution um, because he leaves it up to the political parties for the, for the most of the time, yes, he does get somewhat involved, um, but, you know, he still retains, you know, the status as the head of state. Um, the Taisho democracy, importantly, um, whilst the Taisho period doesn't start until kind of 19, um, you know, 12, and then you know ends with his death in 1926. That's the end of the Taisho period. It's quite short. When we look about the Taisho democracy, we're talking about the period from 1905, so from the Russo-Japanese War all the way up until the last of the party cabinets that are made up of by political parties in 1932. So this is the kind of Taisho-style democracy, even though the Showa Emperor is going to be you know, crowned in 1928, he's actually going to become leader in 1926. When talking about the Taisho democracy, we can think about the period from 1905 to 1932. Within this, the Taisho democracy is, is challenged by a variety of different elements. Okay? And I've drawn, just want to draw your attention to four key elements here. We talk about the constitution. We're talking about changes to the constitution. We're talking about the system of government that is set up under the Meiji government. Um, you know, back in 1889, this Meiji constitution, which is this new kind of development, um, is this going to be able to cope with the modernization of the period in the 1920s? Um, we have the Zaibatsu, these industrial conglomerates made up of very, very powerful families. Um, they wield a huge amount of economic power, and in doing so, they also gain political power as well. We have two major political parties, which are both rivals for control over this very you know, limited democracy. Um, and so you know, we need to think about, okay, well, whilst the Meiji constitution never really intended for these political parties to have you know, a huge amount of power, they are continuing to push for these democratic ideals. Um, and then on the other side of that, we have people looking to retain that kind of traditional power that the oligarchs have. We have the army, the genro, okay, we looked at them in the previous you know, tutorial, these elder statesmen, previous prime ministers, very um, you know, wealthy um, kind of um, leading statesmen in Japanese politics. And then we have other bureaucratic elites who are looking to kind of retain power for themselves um, and, and carve out a position for them where um, not too much power is given to the people. So this is going to lead to, as you can see in the background there, okay, the, the kind of tumbling of the Taisho democracy. And, you know, whilst you could definitely make the argument that the constitutional weaknesses um, and the way in which it's constructed definitely lead to its demise, the pressures of the period in the 1920s really foreground these problems. So I want you to think about, you know, not only the, the problems that the at the, the foundation, but what happens in the period, which makes these um, problems within the foundation, you know, even more you know, evident. You know, you think about widening the the gaps, the, the fractures in kind of society, uh, if you can think about it using that kind of analogy. So in your HSC exam, you could face, okay, in the past four years of the exam, there were each a question which referred in some way to this period. So this is a very, very important period for you to understand. Um, you can see there, okay, what were the internal challenges? What was the role of the Zaibatsu? What were the successes and failures of democracy? Um, and what was this kind of tension between traditional and modern as well? So it's very important for you to understand this tutorial, okay? What you might think about doing is when you finish this tutorial, perhaps come back and maybe do an essay plan 
or of these particular questions so you can kind of reinforce the learning that you've got during this particular tutorial. So we're going to just open by looking at the kind of key timeline, looking at what's happening. So this is going to be, you know, we're going to cover again some similar elements to what we looked at in the first one, but I just want to kind of recap. So the first um, and one of the strongest prime ministers that we have is Takahashi Hara. You will see him referred as Hara K. Um, this is his informal name in Japan. Um, they have sometimes two different names, so just be aware of that. You can refer to them as either, um, but Takahashi... Takahashi Hara um, is one of the strongest prime ministers because he is from the Seyukai party and his cabinet is composed majority of you know Seyukai members apart from the army, the navy and the foreign minister um, and he is the leading member of the Seyukai party. So we have a um, you know, majority government ruled by a prime minister who's from that particular party which um, if you remember anything from our tutorial isn't necessarily always the case. It actually happens twice where we see the party who wins the majority of the elections being put by the Genro as prime minister. So this is a kind of a stable government, very effective. Um, they pass laws to decrease the property tax qualification, um, which helps to increase the size of electorate to 3 million people. Um, and if you know anything from our previous tutorial, um, whilst men over 25 could vote they needed to pay a certain amount of yen per year in taxation in order to qualify as a voting member of that um, group so it's really kind of um, limiting those people at the very bottom of society so we have you know people who are wealthy landowners the majority of those are able to vote so you can think about that when it comes to the you know the kind of the shape of the political democratic environment that we're going to see as again, okay, first May Day celebration, and then Harake is actually assassinated by a leftist in um, in 1921. Um, so we see these kind of rising, fermenting ideas. Um, you can see that with the founding of the Japanese Communist Party in 1922, um, and then we see changes to traditional laws. Okay, which you know, um, you know, now given women the right to attend political meetings, they cannot vote, but um, they can just be, be um, there at political meetings. After the death of um, Takahashi Hara, um, the Navy men take control in this kind of transitional government um, with a cabinet that you can see of, of bureaucrats and house of peers. So we're seeing the shift from this democratic kind of system with a you know, strong Seyukai party leadership, okay, back to the oligarchs. So this is gonna be the continual challenge of this particular period. We then go on, okay, into 1923, where we see the Great Kanto Earthquake completely destroys Tokyo and Yokohama, so a real kind of massive economic hit. Um, and we're also going to see a huge wave of violence against Korean people at this period of time as well. Um, we then have a coalition which helps to kind of reform kind of party politics, and they form a new cabinet um, under Kato Takaki. Um, it's kind of short-lived, but they're going to dispute over tax reform. A lot of the governments in this period are short-lived, um, not only because the governments kind of change a lot, but also because uh, the prime ministers are quite old um, and they die in office as well. So they need to elect new prime ministers. Um, you can see in 1925, this is a really important point. Um, we have in April 22nd, the peace preservation law in which... Um, the government can now take measures and the Home Ministry can now take measures to protect this national essence, okay, this kotu uh, tai, this, you know, essence that makes Japanese, you know, Japanese. And, and so this is a real attempt to kind of suppress, in, you know, foreign ideas like communism and like socialism um, and, and help to retain the power of the emperor. So um, this is a very important point. We see a shift back to this traditional power against these kind of modern ideas. Um, and it's also coupled with universal male suffrage to all men over 25. So it's, it's a real kind of, um, you know, turbulent time where we see efforts to kind of crush democracy um, or, or limit democracy and efforts to kind of support democracy when we have universal male suffrage. So, you know, these are kind of challenging different periods. Um, the you know, key party that I want you to look at, as well as the Seyukai, is the Miseto um, party. Um, they changed their name in 1927. 
Um, and then the last period, which we're going to focus on, is the sh- starts of the shovel financial crisis. Um, this is this time where people lose a lot of faith in the banking system. And then in 1928, we see the rise of this uh, Japanese force in um, China. They are based out of Port Arthur, this port that they gained through the Russo-Japanese War called the Kwangtung Army. Um, and they have clashes with the Japanese troops. They kill a Chinese warlord. Uh, they have clashes with the Chinese troops, I should say. They kill a Chinese warlord called uh, Zhang Jolin. Um, and, you know, this is a time where the, the military are also trying to carve out a position because they're also very wary of these kind of new foreign ideas and they're trying to push for, you know, expansionist imperialist you know, ideas as well. Um, and then we see crackdowns on the Communist Party. Um, and then, you know, it's also important to remember that, you know, within all of this as well, we also have the economic, you know, period um, modernization going on as well. So the government that's elected in 1927 to 1929 under Tanaka Gichi, who is from Seikai, he is labeled a Mitsu cabinet. Mitsu is from one of these Zaibatsu. Um, these large family kind of own conglomerates which uh, have a huge amount of political power um, and he is reprimanded for his actions in China and not having a strong enough by uh, Hirohito himself this is where we see Hirohito becoming involved in politics um, and he leads him to resign and then we have Hamaguchi um, who takes over um, and they're from um, the Niseto government and they're labelled as a Mitsubishi cabinet, um, another one of these Zaibatsu, these family conglomerates. So we're just going to focus on the period up to 1930 because if you know anything from our study of Nazi Germany in 1929, we have a very important global shock, which is the Great Depression. And so that is also going to change the shape of party politics quite dramatically from the period of 1930 you know, up to 1932. So we'll look at that in a following kind of tutorial. So we're going to focus the start of the this kind of tutorial on the political parties, and then we'll get into the other kind of pressures that are faced by the um, Taisho democracy. Um, but between the period from 1924 to 1932, uh, the party cabinets are either controlled by the Miseto, um, previously called the Kenseitai Party, or the Seiyukai. Um, and so they continuously are kind of alternating power. Um, they themselves, as, as, as political parties, are advocating more for their own power. So they're increasingly calling for more political power, more people's voice. Um, they're you know, continually calling for um, a strengthening of the House of Representatives. Remember that it has a dual house system where we have the House of the Peers, which is you know, people who are hereditary or people who are you know, appointed by the emperor. So you think about those kind of people, we're talking about aristocratic, wealthy Japanese people, uh, whereas the House of Representatives, is, or the Diet, is voted on by the people themselves. And this is continually you know, trying to be expanded with lowering property taxation um, and also male suffrage that we see in 1925. Jansen's quote here really kind of surmises the kind of constitutional you know, problems. Um, and as he points out here, the sovereignty and final authority rested with the throne, with the emperor. But most importantly, he needs to make sure that he retains himself as this very much um, divine figure as a part of Shintoism and, and a part of the Japanese kind of consciousness as well. So he needs to be very uh, you know, safe and protected from active participation in case he does, you know, makes the wrong decision, in case he's found fallible, found false or wrong. Um, and so we have, and what he refers to as a form of pluralism, um, this kind of dividing of powers in which you no know, many people participate, but no one was ultimately responsible. So it's not necessarily clear who the kind of key um, you know, power is at the, at the period of time. So this is an overview of the political parties. You may want to kind of pause here to kind of write down these key kind of defining qualities of these two different parties. Um, when talking about the um, Miseto party, you can think of them as slightly more you know, left-wing, but only very slightly. They're kind of, both parties are, are very much kind of, um, you could say, pretty central. Um, and most importantly, the Maseto party, you know, seeks to kind of oppose military invasion of China, okay, stronger relationship um, and with, with China and kind of protecting Japanese interests through diplomacy as opposed to through force. 
Um, they're tied to the Mitsubishi um, Zaibatsu, um, and they kind of return to uh, the gold parity, um, and they, they kind of intentionally generate deflation or to kind of you know solve some problems when it comes to inflationary pressures in the kind of post-war kind of period. Um, the Seiyukai, slightly more conservative, they are big government, financial activism, public investment for industry. Um, they also very harshly put down you know, union protests, strikes and riots. They are supportive of kind of military expansion um, and they also undermine the Maseto party when it comes to this. Um, they are you know, very much focusing on you know, physical expansion um, under their um, financial minister, Takahashi, um, and they're tied to the Mitsu Zabatsu. So these are the kind of two political parties that interchange power from 1924 to 1932. You can see there Gordon kind of surmises the view of the period. Few party leaders saw democracy as an end in itself. It okay? means to ensure the position of the emperor and the empire, national power and social order. That kotu pai, okay? the um, you know, essence of Japanese kind of traditional um view and belief that is the focus of this kind of democracy not necessarily on a vast kind of sweeping democratic reform so when we think about traditional power when you think about this very limited democracy being central to kind of securing the position of the emperor as well so political parties this is just a key kind of overview of some of the things that they do um they you know hara k okay um, push hard against the steel strike in 1920. Okay, in 1923, when we have the Great Kanto Earthquake, um, we see thousands of Koreans are killed. They are blamed uh, for the firestorm that breaks out across Tokyo and Yokohama, and it also gives them an opportunity to, um, you know, massacre political outlaws, think people like feminists, labor leaders, okay, elites, military in the court, okay, a, you know, very much a zero tolerance approach to radical ideas. So we see very conservative style politics during this period of time. Whilst they do expand suffrage in 1922, women only gain the right to attend political meetings. Okay, They're not taking an active role. Um, later on in the period, um, the Seikai administration puts in charge um, this new program called the Social Affairs Bureau, which is to address some key problems of the period, such as unemployment, labor disputes, a tenant farmer protests. Remember, we, if you don't remember what a tenant farmer situation is, where we have a wealthy landowner who then leases that land out to a farmer. And so the farmers are paying a huge amount of rent on the property in which they are farming on. Um, so this is a system where it really kind of exploits the farmers and so they don't get very much from the land at all. Um, they also push you know, health insurance law and revise kind of factory laws, but this is very much limited by the Privy Council. We're going to look at that later on. Um, the case Thai cabinet um, in 1924 expands kind of social policy. We have the tenant farmer dispute mediation law, um, and they also bring in universal suffrage in 1925 as well. So we see efforts to kind of progress this democracy and efforts to kind of solve some of the issues um, and try to represent the people's voice. But it also is um, also sharply opposed against um, crackdowns on foreign ideas um, and, you know, very much uh, a strengthening of this kind of Japanese first kind of movement that we see as well. Um, and so I like to call this kind of period of 1925 where we have evolution and devolution. We see progression and evolution towards democracy and universal male suffrage, which is extended to all men over 25 on May 5th. But it also is paired with the peace preservation law, which makes criticism of the emperor a capital offense. So this is a real focus of the law in terms of securing traditional power. Um, it's also... Um, during this period, they arrest 1,600 people, they prosecute 500, and we get the establishment of the TOKO, the Special Higher Police, which now have the rights to suppress communists and socialists, and they could protect Kotutai um, and, and private property. So here you can see a real kind of um, reaction against the kind of socialist kind of elements that we see filtering into Japan in the 1920s. You can see that really clearly in this poster, which... 
uh, promotes the All Jap Japan, Japan Proletariat Young Men's Federation, the second national congress of this group. Um, it also, you can see down the bottom there, they're also advertising works by Karl Marx and Rosa Luxemburg. This is the communist who leads, um, you know, the, the, the uh, failed communist revolution in, in Germany uh, in the 1920s as well. Um, so here we see a system where whilst there is attempts to kind of strengthen democracy and, and towards modernization with universal suffrage, it's paired with uh, very much conservative politics to kind of secure um, tai and, and, and traditional power as well. Um, and this is the kind of symbolism that I want you to think about with the time. Um, the Home Ministry poster okay, celebrates the establishment of universal male suffrage, calls on voters to go on to their polling stations so that public opinions for a Showa restoration will become a reality. Um, and so this is what this period is, is called, a real um, the Showa restoration, you know, taking language from the Meiji restoration, this new modern Japan that's going to come about because of the new emperor um, and the um, you know, new uh, universal male suffrage, which is granted in, in 1925. Um, future will be bright, okay, stain, okay, or darkness will fall. Um, okay, so this kind of show of restoration refers to the political revitalization um, of the period. Um, and the Hirohito, the Showa Emperor, is going to become Emperor in 1928. He's going to be crowned then. He's going to become Emperor in 1926. He's not officially um, crowned um, in, in, until 1928. So this is really trying to advocate, you can see, for people going to the polls. Um, but we want the right people. We don't want communists. We don't want socialists. So it is this kind of binary system. Um, if we don't vote, you, know, you can see that we won't have a restoration. But if we do, um, we also only want people who fit in with what it means to be kind of Jap Japanese in this kind of very traditional sense. That is going to be the focus for this tutorial. When we come back in the next tutorial, I'm going to be focusing on the economic pressures, particularly looking at um, a few key events. We talk about the Great Kanto Earthquake. We'll also look at the Showa financial crisis, and we'll also look at the power of the Zaibatsu and the pressures that they place on the Taisho democracy. What you should think about doing as you move through this tutorial is have a think about, okay, well, how, what impact is this gonna have on the Taisho democracy? How does this lead to destabilization? How does this lead to um, challenges to traditional power? Do we see a push towards modernization? Um, so these are the kind of key themes that you should be focusing on as well as that key central inquiry question of how effectively did they manage the pressures of the period? I'll see you in the next tutorial focusing again on the 1920s in Japan. Thank you.